Hi there, and welcome to Creativity, Montessori, and the Meaning of Life. I'm your host, Robin Norgren. I'm going to start with a reading from a book called Awaken by Priscilla Shearer. Let's start with Luke 2, 25. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. A shooting star. I'm almost certain that's what it is. I casually glanced upward into the evening sky while walking groceries into the house from the car. And there it was. The tail end of a shooting star jetting through the heavens. Or was it? I couldn't tell for sure. It all happened so fast. You know how it is. One of those moments when you wish you could somehow rewind the tape, go back a minute, call the kids outside to come watch with you, and then be standing there, head upturned, eyes peeled upon the spot? If you knew it was coming, if you knew what to be watching for, you could catch the whole thing from beginning to end. God is moving and working all around us. But more often than not, we've got our head down, fixed on getting through the day. We're not thinking beyond the immediate present, not looking for indications of God's activity. Just looking at our watch and our list of things to do, wondering how we'll ever be able to get it all done. Simeon, however, was a man who was waiting on the Messiah. He had his day job, I'm sure, things that needed to be routinely maintained and accomplished. But he was simultaneously on the alert, always looking for something someone special and life-changing. The Holy Spirit told him the Deliverer was near, and because he wanted nothing more than to see this promised one with his own eyes, he postured his heart in a continual state of holy anticipation, just in case this could be the day when the Son of God showed up on the landscape with his life, of his life, changing everything for him and for everyone else around him. That's why Mary and Joseph entered the temple grounds. And when they did, Simeon saw much, much more than everyone else, who likely saw nothing more than an ordinary Jewish family. He recognized instead the face of humankind's salvation, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel, Luke 2.32. Is your heart fixed today? to recognize the presence of God, to see his fingerprints and hear his voice, the events that others call coincidence, will you recognize them as sovereign providence? Ask the Lord to sharpen your spiritual senses so that you can catch a glimpse of his glory. Focus your expectation. Lean forward or on tiptoe. Resist the inclination to be so caught up in the temporal that you miss seeing the eternal. Scan the horizon for where his voice is calling out to you or where his fingerprints are working on your behalf. Be alert. Be present. Be fully engaged in the day stretched out before you. He'll be there waiting to be seen by anyone watching and waiting. Some thoughts from Austin Kleon's book, Steal Like an Artist. At some point, you have to move from imitating your your heroes to emulating them. Imitation is about copying. Emulation is when imitation goes one step further, breaking through into your own thing. There isn't a move that's a new move. The basketball star Kobe Bryant has admitted that all of his moves on the court were stolen from watching tapes of his heroes. But initially, when Bryant stole a lot of those moves, he realized he couldn't completely pull them off because he didn't have the same body type as the guys he was thieving from. He had to adapt the moves to make them his own. 
Conan O'Brien has talked about how comedians try to emulate their heroes, fall short, and end up doing their own thing. Johnny Carson tried to be Jack Benny, but ended up Johnny Carson. David Letterman, Letterman tried to copy Johnny Carson, but ended up David Letterman. And Conan O'Brien tried to be David Letterman, but ended up Conan O'Brien. In O'Brien's words, it is our failure to become our perceived idea that ultimately defines us and makes us unique. Thank goodness. A wonderful flaw about human beings is that we're incapable of making perfect copies. Our failure to copy our heroes is where we discover where our own thing lies. This is how we evolve. So, copy your heroes, examine where you fall short. What's in there that makes you different? That's what you should amplify and transform into your own work. In the end, merely imitating your heroes is not flattering them. Transforming their work into something of your own is how you flatter them. Adding something to the world that only you can add. So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Some words from Save by a Poem by Kim Rosin. The first time I actually lived a poem by heart, it happened inadvertently. I was 15. Mr. Barclay, the public speaking teacher at Weston High, had assigned the sophomore class the task of memorizing a poem. Of course, I had memorized before. At 10, I learned my lines as Mr. Bumble in the all-girl production of Oliver. At about 12, I discovered the trick of memorizing chapter summaries for my textbooks to hide the, fight I, the, the fact I couldn't read all the pages my teachers assigned. And of course, I had memorized the requisite lists of state capitals, how to spell Mississippi, and even the first 15 lines of the Canterbury Tales in Middle English, assigned in seventh grade and learned by rote. Not to mention the plethora of rhymes, lyrics, and commercial jingles that accidentally find a way into everyone's memory without invitation or choice. I had memorized all of these. I had not learned them by heart. Several weeks before Mr. Barclay decreed that we memorize and recite a poem, my new friend Samantha had given me a gift of 100 selected poems by E.E. E. Cummings. In the years since I had met her, Samantha had introduced me to books unlike any I had ever known, books that seemed to reach right through me into an inner sanctum where my most private wanderings and knowings lived, until then in loneliness. He, she seemed to see through my awkward, overly articulate mask to a depth that no one had recognized in me before. She taught me how to throw the I Ching and to make tea with dry of dry herbs after school over chamomile tea we would read aloud the writings of cummings for the first time in my life through the revelations and agonies of this book i was discovering that there were others like me so i chose my favorite cummings poem for the assignment somewhere i have never traveled gladly beyond this poem had become a kind of sanctuary for me ever since i had found it Intending to learn the words by heart, I curled up in the window seat of my bedroom and opened the book to the dog-eared page where the words glowed with the yellow in, of my highlighter. The first few lines were relatively easy. I learned them like I learned the minuet in G for my piano lesson, 
drilling myself over and over in the places where I made mistakes, until my fingers knew the notes or someone screamed from elsewhere in the house, Stop that! You're going to drive me crazy! It was the same with learning words. When I came to something I couldn't remember, I repeated it in a sing-song way until it virtually lost meaning and was inscribed as a pattern of sound in my memory. It seemed a bit sad that a poem that brought me so much joy was now being stripped of meaning in the name of memorization. But I accepted that as the price of the task. I settled in for a long and boring evening. Then I came to these lines. You open always, petal by petal, myself as spring opens. Her first rose. Suddenly, I could not go any further. There was something so naked about the statement that it scared me. I couldn't imagine ever saying it in front of other people. What had I been thinking when I chose this poem? Even to imagine speaking it out loud caused a collision inside me between the self-conscious girl who hid behind her horn-rimmed glasses and another self who had magnetized by, who was magnetized by the desire and tenderness in these words. Even at 15, I knew I was imprisoned by its inhibitions. While my friends screamed for the Beatles and learned to slow dance with the boys, I hid in the bathroom. While they went shopping for tight jeans and experimented with mascara, I made infirmaries in the garage for hurt pigeons and squirrels. In those days, it seemed there was no bridge between my inner life and the world around me. I sensed there was another language, one that could tell the surgings inside me, but I did not know how to speak it. What I did know was that the hungers of my heart were crushed behind a mask of distance, intelligence, and control. I desperately wanted out. I tasted the words tentatively. The sensuality in them frightened me. The closeness the simple, undisguised longing. And in that moment, I recognized that I had to make a choice between my habitual control and the truth of my inner being. The price of the authenticity I long for was my willingness to take this plunge. <laughs>